I am Tyler Young. I go by Tyler A. Young on the internet because there are too many Tyler Youngs. Um, if you would like to follow along with the slides on your own device, uh, you can get them from my Twitter or my, my blog there. Yeah, so today we're going to be talking about using um, Phoenix and some of the tools that it gives us and kind of extending those to improve the user experience of collaborative apps built on Phoenix. Uh, very briefly about me, I joke that I'm a recovering C++ developer. I spent 10 years working on a product called uh, X-Plane. It's a flight simulator. And toward the end of my time there, I got to build this massive multiplayer game server. Um, and we used Elixir for that. And I kind of fell in love with it and haven't wanted to do anything else since. Today I work at a company called Felt. We make this collaborative map making tool that has been described as a Figma for maps. Um, this is a little example map that I, I built. This is uh, Bruce and Maggie Tate's uh, Great Loop journey. So they're taking this boat trip around the eastern half of the US. And uh, you can see I've imported the, the red dots are the points at which they stopped. Uh, there's some like line drawings of the path that they had planned. There are links and images and stuff. And all of this can be edited and, oh, let's see if my video is gonna work. Uh, it can be collaboratively edited. So uh, here I've got two panes, and you know, the, the person on the right is watching the other person make changes, and then in the, in the right window, we're gonna go make some changes in a minute here as well. Um, and so all of this happens in real time. There we go. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a cool product. Our core, oh, come on, oh. Oh, come on, <laughs> pardon me. Uh, our guiding principle with Felt has always been that we want to make a web app that people love to use. And I came up with like four key areas that I, that I think of when I think of like a web app that I want to use. Uh, the first is low latency. Um, nobody wants to use an app where you're, you're typing and you can feel like a pause with every keystroke as it tries to catch up, right? Um, you want low waiting. This is related but kind of different. If uh, simple actions require like five page loads. Uh, I'm looking at you, Jira, uh, and each one takes five seconds. You know, that, that it really starts to drag on you. Um, high reliability. Data loss bugs are the absolute worst as a user, right? Like you want to be able to trust that the application is, is you know, it's coming along with you as you're, as you're making your edits. Uh, and finally, you know, a great web app gets out of your way and, and enables you to do the thing that you came here for and doesn't make you futz with the, the uh, application itself. So that's like the four goals that we're gonna be talking about. Um, and it's kind of interesting to note that there's a little bit of inherent tension between these. Like you can imagine if you wanted a maximally reliable web app, every keystroke goes to the database before we let you continue editing, right? Because God forbid we lose you know, your, your next keystroke. Um, and so you, there's gonna be trade-offs, right? Like everything in programming, there's gonna be trade-offs. So concretely, um, from a technology side, like what does that look like? How, how, how do we get there? If you've been around the Phoenix space, as I assume many of you have, you know that channels are, are good for real-time collaboration and that sort of thing, live view being built on channels. But like, what's next? Like, I've set up channels, now what? That's what we're gonna talk about. So first of all, channels are great, and, and building a collaborative web app on Phoenix channels is an excellent idea indeed. Channels, because they're based on web sockets, they give you this persistent and stateful connection. Um, this is like the absolute opposite, polar opposite of, um, of a REST response where the REST response has to embed all the information that, that the server needs to understand like who you are and what your context is and that sort of thing. Um, you know, you, having a process around that keeps that state is very useful. Um, web sockets are by nature low latency. You can do one handshake with the server at, at the start of the web socket connection rather than one per message. 
um, and they are fundamentally bi-directional. Um, in a REST model, you would need to have your clients ping the server every now and then, hey, got any new me messages? Any new messages now? Any updates? Um, and with WebSockets, you can push from the server and say, here is the new update. Um, but there is more that you'll need as you're building your real-world web app than just channels. So let's first talk about minimizing waiting. With Felt, we thought it was important that the initial experience of getting, getting the map on screen um, should be as fast as possible. Uh, as fast as a screenshot is like the goal, right? Um, or faster, you know, if you... JPEG might be a megabyte. Uh, we can do better than that. Um, so we wanted to get useful state on the screen even before the WebSocket had opened. We didn't want to wait for the page to first load, the JavaScript to load, the WebSocket to open, and the, the WebSocket to send back, you know, like an on-join message. Um, and so we include, like, the initial state of the app um, embedded in the HTML. And this is like the simplest code example ever, but it's actually worth talking about a little bit. Um, rather than just dumping um, a JSON object, uh, sorry, a JavaScript object into a script tag, uh, we actually dump it into a div, um, and then we use JavaScript to parse that and, and um, set the state from there. This avoids a cross-site scripting vulnerability because we get to leverage Phoenix's HTML escaping. Um, and there's a link here. Again, you can get it from the slides. Um, the other advantage that you get from doing things this way is that for users who are not logged in, in our case, they don't, they don't have editing rights, they don't see um, necessarily everything that, that a logged in user would, and so we could potentially cache their entire experience. We can cache the, the JSON blob, we can cache the HTML, um, and you know, if we get slash dotted or whatever, uh, there, there would be very little load on our server. Um, in practice, we haven't actually done this because even when we were on like the TechCrunch homepage, um, the, the server didn't break a sweat. So, you know, blame, blame Elixir and Phoenix for being too fast. <laughs> um, moving on, talking about minimizing latency, uh, we do optimistic client-side edits. So when a client makes a change, the web app, in our case, it's built in React, it assumes that it's going to be uh, successful. So when you drag an image from one place to another or when you start typing some text, uh, it sends that to the server, but in the meantime, you know, behaves as though it'll go through. And that is true, 99 point many nines of the time. Um, but we do have to, you know, have some additional plumbing there to handle the case where the server says it didn't work or, or you know, your network connection is down or whatever. Um, and that's not rocket science, right? Like, optimistic local edits is, is a thing lots of people do. Uh, something I hadn't actually seen before, um, that uh, was, was pretty cool is we do these optimistic broadcasts. So in the normal workflow, your client, in our case React, sends an edit to the server, you write it to the database, and then you broadcast it to everybody else connected to your channel. Um, we have kind of inverted this. Client sends an edit to the server. We actually broadcast it then to everybody else connected, thereby having the lowest possible latency for that, that transmission from one client to another. Um, and then we write it to the database, and the, this is kind of neat because we can then write it to the database kind of on our own schedule, like if you wanted to break it off into a separate process, um, if you wanted to batch those, those database writes every, you know, X seconds or whatever, you could do that. Um, but again, you do still need to build in the ability to roll back those changes um, if the edit was, was unsuccessful when it actually went to the database. Um, let's talk about blocking the channel process. So as you may know, processes in Elixir and in, on the Beam in general, they handle all the messages coming into them sequentially. And this is really nice for solving all manner of concurrency bugs, uh, but it can present challenges um, if, you're not, if you're not planning for it. So in particular, blocking of the channel process is a little bit like blocking the UI thread in a mobile app or, or the user thread in JavaScript. Um, it makes everything unresponsive. And so if you have a long-running task that is running within your channel process, um, suddenly, you know, messages that should be going out to your, your connected user just don't. As a, a, a very trivial example, let's imagine we had a Fibonacci uh, server uh, you've got this channel open, and a message comes in, please give me the fourth Fibonacci number. And the channel responds in a millisecond or less. 
and it moves on to the next message. Please give me the eighth Fibonacci number again, a millisecond. And then the next message waiting in the queue asks for the 10,000th Fibonacci number, and suddenly um, everything stops, <laughs> and, and you can't get any status updates or anything from the server until it finishes sending that. Um, that's a problem. What you can do sparingly and, and um, with your own good judgment is you can break things out into their own process. So if, in the case of the Fibonacci server, um, you know, the request that you asked for the 10,000th number, uh, that's not related to the person asking for the third or the fifth. Uh, like, those can happen in parallel. We don't need that sequential ordering guarantee that, that uh, Beam processes give us. So what we do is, on line two, we, we take a reference to the socket uh, so that we can not reply to the socket request yet. And then, using a task supervisor, we spawn off a new process, and we do the work there. And from there, we can reply to the person who asked for that number and, and give them the result. Right, this does break sequential ordering guarantees, buyer beware. The other thing I'll say about this is that it's not always obvious when you write some code that is going to be slow in the channel process. Um, it's very easy to write. It's very easy to pass it through code review. Uh, it's very easy to roll into production um, and only have you know, only learn about it when a user says, like, why is it slow whenever I do this? Uh, what we've done is we've attached an event handler to this, this channel handled in event that Phoenix publishes um, to log when this happens. Um, this looks pretty much like attaching any telemetry handler event. Uh, it's the, it's the actual handler itself that is maybe worth talking about. Um, the duration that Phoenix gives you is in system time units, so you do need to convert that to, uh, you know, human time, milliseconds in our case. Um, and, you know, you can play with the max duration that you want to log, or the max duration that you want to allow without logging. Uh, the nice thing here is that you get all the parameters that came into the channel that caused that message, so assuming that it wasn't like, you know, the database is overloaded by other things, uh, assuming it was the message that caused this, uh, you can reproduce that pretty easily. So let's move on and talk about um, improving the reliability of your application. So the scary thing for our use case is if you're in the middle of editing an app, uh, edit, editing a map, excuse me, and you lose your internet connection, suddenly um, we can't save the stuff that you're doing, right? So we have built a lot of infrastructure around handling that. So first of all, uh, PhoenixJS builds on top of the browser's native WebSocket um, APIs, which is great, like they're very solid. They do have this quirk um, that is not Phoenix's fault, but is just a quirk of the APIs themselves. Um, they don't fire an error for the WebSocket being disconnected 30 to 60 seconds after you lose your inter internet connection. So if you, if you turn off your Wi-Fi, you wait, and you wait, and you wait. Uh, we wanted to be able to detect it a lot faster than this. Um, the other scary scenario is what happens if your channel just stops responding. Your WebSocket is alive and healthy, but you can't actually get messages to or from uh, the server via your channel. Uh, both of those are, are scenarios we wanted to, to handle. So first of all, detecting when you're offline is easy. The browser's navigator.online property changes really fast, like, like sub-second when you, when you turn off your Wi-Fi or that sort of thing. Um, Apologies to those of you allergic to JavaScript, avert your eyes. Uh, <laughs> we're in React, and so we, we start with the, the state of our online property as navigator.online, and then listen for the online and offline events. And then if online is ever false, we, we show this alert. Uh, you can imagine lots of ways to improve the handling of this and make it kind of a, a soft notification, or maybe we lock your editing toolbar or whatever. Um, we're, we, we have designs and plans for the future. Uh, for that nightmare scenario where the, the WebSocket's healthy but the channel's not, we've created these channel-specific heartbeat messages. And the idea here is that uh, shortly after the page loads, we start sending periodic messages to the server and just checking that we got a reply. This, uh, because we, we set a JavaScript timeout for you know, when we should receive these responses by, um, if the server is very backed up, if the channel's backed up, um, 
we won't just wait until we hear back with an error. We'll, we'll actually say, okay, the server's been given long enough to respond and it didn't do it, so there's a problem here. Um, and we're not, we're not saving whatever it is that you're sending the server. Uh, it also detects when the initial connection ne negotiation, maybe on the WebSocket, maybe on the channel, who knows, uh, has hung. Um, and, and again, you've not received either an error or success message. Uh, this is pretty trivial stuff. You could write it yourself, but it is worth mentioning. Like, if you have to send a message, you might as well send a timestamp uh, as the server is aware of the time uh, so that you can do some clock synchronization between your client and server. Um, this is useful if you want the client to be able to tell you, at this exact time, I created this element or I made this change or whatever. Uh, instead of relying on the client's clock, you can. The client clock will be more reliable over short durations than saying, you know, uh, this many seconds since 1970 or whatever. The next step for data reliability for us was to cache the edits that you make locally. Um, in our, our scheme for detecting when you're not connected to the server, um, there's always going to be some time between like when your edits were going through versus when we detected that you went offline, right? And, and for those edits, uh, we wanted to do some, some local caching. And there are interesting theoretical issues in this space because it's not always clear when it's safe to apply um, a particular edit later. Um, in the most extreme example, like you can imagine, um, you've got a web app to, um, to shut down your nuclear power plant or something, right? And if you hit the shutdown button now, and three days later, you know, the server finally receives it, like it's not, you probably didn't want to do that anymore, right? Like you probably, you've, you've probably done something else to work around it. Um, and the same kind of goes with uh, editing in a collaborative map, right? Um, if, if it's many days or many other people have edited the map since your thing uh, occurred, like maybe, maybe you don't still want that. It's not, it's not clear. Um, so we have focused on uh, the caching and, and, and you know, later applying the edits that we feel very confident that you want to save. Um, and for us, that is just newly, newly created elements. We can be pretty sure you, you, you wanted those and somebody else didn't duplicate that work later. Oh, did I just? Okay. Um, yeah, so what we do is any time you make one of these changes that we might want to back up, uh, we... Am I... Am I still on? Is it? Okay, sorry, sorry, it sound, the sound cut out over here. Okay, sorry. Um, anytime you, you make a change that we would want to apply later, we store it in the local storage. And if we don't receive a response from the server saying that it was successful, we will try to flush that the next time that we do get the internet connection back, and the next time you load the page, whatever it might be. Um, this does require that you handle cases where the change actually did go through, but your client didn't get the message back. Maybe it fired off the request and then you closed the page or refreshed or whatever. Um, in our case, that's easy with uh, element creation because you know if we've heard of this UUID before, uh, we just won't do it, right? And there are, there's lots of interesting work in this space um, for you know, how you might apply these changes that happen in a distributed fashion without a network connection. CRDTs is, is the model that um, I could imagine potentially moving forward, moving toward in the future. Um, but of course, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of momentum that you lose from doing that, right? Because everything, everything becomes more complicated. Every feature you, you build kind of pays that tax. Um, the last area that I want to talk about with improving data reliability is being resilient to lost messages. And this is something that's going to totally vary so much depending on your particular use case. Um, but at the heart of it, like, networks are unreliable. Uh, you've got people refreshing tabs, closing tabs. Um, you've got server deploys that, that happen. And all of this could cause a message to be lost or a message to be received by the server and then not processed, uh, you know. And we, we want to be more permissive in what we accept and, and what we can keep safe for the user. Um, so for us, the, the most obvious way that we, we were able to apply this is deciding that we didn't actually need to see a create message for a particular map element before we would accept an update. Uh, so if the creation message got lost because of any of a number of things, uh, but we did get an update that has the full geometry of the element, um, We'll call it an upsert and, and um, accept it happily. 
And finally, I'd like to talk about a few ways that we have not improved things, but we can imagine doing so in the future. So first of all, actually multi-node, um, using multi-node deploys uh, so that as we're doing our, our blue-green deployments, we don't lose the, uh, like the messages on the Phoenix pub sub. Um, that has rolled out since I wrote this slide, and it has been, uh, it's been a win. It has revealed a couple of pre-existing bugs, uh, but uh, you know, it, that's, it's a little bit of growing pains, and I think in the long term, we're going to be happy with it and keep it. Um, CRDTs, we already talked about. Um, I realize I didn't explain that uh, acronym. Uh, that is uh, conflict-free replicated data types. Uh, it's a theoretical area of, of study uh, for distributed changes and combining them back together. Um, fully offline editing is an interesting area that we'd like to explore. There are <laughs> there's a very fundamental challenge that is not technical at all in nature, which is how do you build a UI to communicate to users that, hey, you can edit here offline, but if you never come back online, if you don't give us an internet connection at some point, we can't save your stuff. Um, and that's like, a, that's like a user messaging problem, um, more than a technical one, but uh, m might be the biggest concern for me. Um, of course, in a mapping application, uh, there's lots of things like there's, there's tile data, for one. You know, if you zoom in on an area of the map, we'd like to show you a higher resolution version of that. But there's also things like we, we have this big curated data library that it's not sure, it's not clear how we might cache that or, or what, we, what we might do to handle that. Uh, certainly, we could do global distribution running on fly.io and uh, minimize latency by being, you know, running the servers close to users. I think that looks amazing, and I would love to have some time to, to play with it. And finally, there is the prospect. Uh, we talked about serving the initial state of the app in, in a JSON blob when you load the page. Um, there's, there's a very scary possibility where between the time that the initial page was served and the time that you, know, you actually get your WebSocket connection up, you, you miss some changes. And those right now are not you're, you're never going to see that, right? If somebody changed the map in that time, they are going to be looking at a different map than you are until you refresh your page. Um, and the same goes you know, if you are offline briefly while somebody else is editing. Um, that sounds like a really fun problem to work on to me, but we have, haven't gotten there yet. It's a young company. Uh, once again, uh, slides are at my Twitter or website. Um, we have talked about minimizing waiting as you load the page minimizing latency as you are editing, uh, both minimizing latency for the person doing the editing and the people watching uh, across the internet. And finally, we've talked about minimizing data loss by detecting issues with your connection to the server and backing up changes and, and applying them later.